All right, so three problems that are due tomorrow. 152 is one of them. So let's, let's have a look at that. All right, so what we want to do is we want to know how these points are going to move. So this is fixed over here. This is not going to move at the wall. And then we have those forces applied. And what we want to know is we want to find the deformation of points D, C, and B, C, and D. So there's a lot of words that mean the same thing. I, I use them kind of interchangeably. There's deformation, there's delta, if I could spell anyway, not my best skill. And there's also displacement. These are all words that all mean the same thing, okay? They all mean something is moving, okay? So the good thing is they all begin with the letter D. Okay, so they're all pretty much equivalent. All right, so what we want to know then is what is delta B, delta C, and delta D. Now we know that delta is the load times the length divided by the area divided by the modulus. And you'll notice that you're given some of those things. You're given uh, the length and you're given the modulus, you've got the diameter so you can find the area. So you need to know what the loads are. Now what's going to happen here is this thing, these things are going to change length. Whenever you have a load, you have a deformation. So you're going to have a change in length of each one of those pieces. Now each one of those parts that make up that shaft are going to change differently because they have different loads on them and they have different diameters. So you have to break the object up into its component pieces and deal with each one separately. Okay, that, that's what you end up having to do because each piece, A to B, has its own diameter. It's going to have its own load on it. B to C has its own diameter and it'll have its own load on it and C to D will have its own diameter and load on it. So you have to break this thing up into three pieces because you have these changing conditions as you go from A to B, B then B, C, and then C, D, all right? So, so that's the deal with this. Now, you've got a fair amount of information here. I mean, you've got the modulus and you've got the length. You can get the area very easily just by going pi r squared. Um, and so that's easy enough. So, you know, you have the, uh, you can get those three things pretty quickly. So this area here, if we just make a table here for area, what you're going to have is pi on this one. Remember, on round things, the normal information that's given is diameter. Remember, you need to take half of that for a radius. Also, with the metric stuff, I get everything to Newton, everything to meters, and then when I get my answers, I apply the proper prefix, you know, meganewtons, kilonewtons, giganewtons, whatever. So, so I, uh, the first thing I want to do here is get this area and so I'll do that by taking the radius which would be 0.04 meters squared okay and you just go through and do that so you just want to get those radii in uh, in meters okay so now you've got three of the things now the last thing you need is the internal force all right so what makes this object here stretch or compress and actually that first one is going to compress a little bit, so it's going to move in a little bit. Okay. Now what makes that happen is the internal force, the force that's inside that part of the shaft. So you need to find the internal part of the shaft, or the internal force in the shaft. So there's a process for that. And the process is first to find the reaction at A. So we want to find that. Now that's an external force, so we can find it just using regular statics. So I would have that unknown RA to the right, 3 and 3 get me 6 to the left, 6 and 6 get me 12 to the right, and I have 8 to the left, which is negative. So based on that, I can find the reaction. It's 2 kilonewtons to the right. That's what's happening at A. So the net of these forces here are trying to push that shaft into the wall 
the walls push it has to push back with two kilonewtons to maintain equilibrium. So we good with that? Okay, it's compression. Well, the reaction isn't compression yet. The reaction is just to the right. So when you say why is compression? Oh, why is the net force pushing it into the wall? Is that what you mean, or are you looking at AB, or what do you say? What yet? What do you mean by yet? Okay. Right. Okay. So here's how we identify compression and tension. First, you want to find the reaction. The reaction will get you all the forces acting on the object. Now you want to find the internal force. And the way you do that is you make a cut through the part where you want to find the internal force. Then you take one entire side of the object or the other. So I'm going to do a force analysis of that little piece of the shaft. And that's how I'm going to find the internal force. So when I pull that off, um, what I'm going to have is the shaft, and then I'm going to have wherever I cut it right there, like so. Okay, I've got a reaction. Two kilonewtons is 2,000 newtons. Then I want to find what is happening inside the shaft. Now that's the load anywhere between A and B. Okay. Now I can do that. I can just sum, uh, and actually, why don't I do it this other way here? I, I showed it going this way because I kind of knew how it was going to turn out. So I put PAB doing that. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, I know this piece of the shaft is at equilibrium. It's not accelerating. So if the reaction is pushing to the right with 2,000 newtons, internally, there has to be a force pushing back to the left. Okay to hold equilibrium. And when I solve that with some of Fx, I get um, 2,000 minus PAB. And I've got a little typo there. That's such a compression right there. And so I'm going to get PAB is 2,000. I get a positive answer, meaning it acts to the right. And it's in compression because both sides are being pushed on, which is shortening that thing up. Is that, I don't know if that answers your question at all. Is that? Yeah. I mean, like, for the first, the first snippet of it, I can say it's like C that is um, compression. Uh -huh. But then, like, say the tension is C, that's just going to be going down. Yeah. Down. It's, uh, so, and that force would be going down. Yeah. yeah, that, well, if you get, okay, if you go to BC, the next step, um, now, let's see. Why don't I just, why don't I just follow up with something, because I just think it's worth it. Why don't I, Let's look at the other side of this cut, okay? Because you can analyze this side of the cut too. And why don't I just do that real quick? So here I've got eight pushing. I got 12 going back this way. And then I've got six. And I want to find the internal force in AB. See, I'm going to get the same answer. The calculation is going to be a little bit different, but I'm going to get the same thing. There's PAB, which is pushing on that piece of the shaft, minus 6 plus 12 minus 8. So PAB again will be 2. Okay. So that'll be 2,000 Newton's compression. Hope so. So you could use either side to analyze. It doesn't matter, okay? You get the same answer regardless. All right. We good with that? Okay. Now let's look at the center shaft now. Next, okay. All right. So what we have here is we found that this reaction is two kilonewtons. So let's go ahead and cut through the next piece of the shaft. See, we've got a real change happening at B. We've got a different shaft diameter and we have different loading. So as a result of that, we're going to have a different internal force in the shaft, anywhere between B and C. It, it'll change. So if I use that right-hand side,
you're going to end up with something like this. So we got 2,000 newtons. And then on right here, we've got 6,000, right? And then we have this unknown load right here that has to hold equilibrium. And that's the load in BC. So there's the free body diagram anywhere in between B and C. And again, it's just a matter of solving out a little equilibrium equation here. Sum of fx is zero. I've got 2,000 to the right, and I've got 6,000 to the left, and then I have PBC. So I can solve for PBC, and that will come out to be 4,000. Newtons, and that's in the positive sense. I got a positive answer, so that means it does act to the right, and it's stretching that piece of the shaft out. Okay, is that? So that's tension. Is that good? We got any questions on that? So, what, if we found the load between B C, uh -huh. that would help us find the deformation at B. That will tell you how BC stretches out because okay. it has a load in there equal to 4,000 tension. So that piece of the shaft, that small diameter piece of the shaft between B and C is going to stretch. It's going to get longer. Between B and C, does that mean that when that stretches, does that mean it's going to go this way and it's going to go this way? Um, What's the, the way I would look at this is B is going to get shorter. So I kind of look at this as reference points. Um, it would be helpful. There's a concept in dynamics of relative motion, the motion of A with respect to B. I kind of look at it the same way here. Um, the uh, first thing I'm going to look at is how B moves with respect to A. A doesn't move. A is the reference point. So the way I look at this is B is going to pull in towards A a little bit. Now, with respect to B, C is going to stretch out because BC is in tension. That, so I don't think it moves both directions. I think of reference points. Start at A, then look at what B does relative to that, then look at what C does relative to B. That's how I look at it. I kind of look at three different pieces getting longer or shorter, then you put them back together starting at A. Is that, if that helps, I don't know. All right, so are we good? So once you get these internal forces, you multiply them by the length, you find the area and divide by that, and you divide by E, the modulus. And what you're gonna get is the delta for each piece of that shaft. So AB gets shorter by 0.001023, BC gets longer by 0 0.005002, and CD gets shorter by 0 0.009452. So if I want to know what's happening to D, D actually moves a little bit towards A. These three effects combine together, and D moves closer to A, is what ends up happening. Because okay. AB gets shorter, BC gets longer, CD gets shorter. So the combined effect of that, when you add the numbers up, gets you what happens to D. Okay. Good with that? Okay. Questions on that one? Okay. All right, now the next one is statically indeterminate. Do we, do we have questions on this one? Yeah, I could go over it a little bit, but if there's specific questions, why don't you let me know. Right, so 
On this one, um, what's happening is you have that 90,000 pound load pushing down and it's going to be taken up by both the concrete and the steel, both. All right. And the issue is, is you don't know how much goes into the concrete and how much goes into the steel. What you know is that if you go sum of Fy and set that equal to zero, you're going to have the load of the steel plus the load of the concrete okay, minus the 90,000. is equal to zero. So what that tells you is the load in the steel plus the load in the concrete is equal to 90,000. Okay. So that's what I, that's the statics part that you do on this. Okay. Now the problem is is that you've got two unknowns, the load in the steel and the load in the concrete and you only have one equation so you've got to come up with another way of relating these things together okay. and what we'll start with in this class is strength of materials okay. now if you keep taking structural stuff which the civils definitely will I'm not quite sure how sure how far the mechanicals get into it but um, you can solve things that are just completely statically indeterminate much more than this by using energy methods of the materials and looking up how much energy they absorb and doing it actually it ends up being an energy balance it's a little involved it takes a while to get there but this is kind of the first step down that road where we're looking at ways of going beyond just statics you know statics you're limited on how many unknowns you can solve for and when you're doing statics you're always given problems that are solvable with just statics but there's lots of ways to solve this stuff out ways that are far more advanced than statics. You always start with statics, but you can go a long way beyond that. Okay? So the way you go beyond it in our class, and, and this is pretty consistent, although you, you elaborate on this quite a bit, is you say, well, that's just a pier, a solid cylinder. The change in the concrete, the delta, will equal the, the, the delta of the steel, and that equals PL over AE. Okay? So this is kind of the key way we go beyond just statics. We use this deformation relationship. Okay. That delta is PL over AE. So the deformation of the concrete equals the deformation of the oh, steel? Yeah, I've got a typo there. So that should say steel. There we go. Okay. And you can equate those two things together. So what you can do with this basically is just generate a second equation. And you're going to have two equations and two unknowns, and you can solve it out. Okay. Once you have the load in the steel and the load in the concrete, you can check what the delta would be of either material and figure out what the, how much that pier will compress when you load it. Okay. Now the thing is, you don't know you don't know PS or PC yet. Okay. So those are the unknowns. So you're going to get the load in the concrete times its length, which is 40 inches divided by its area. Now you want to find the area of this stuff. Now be a little careful there. The area of the steel. What do we got? We got eight bars, I think. Now we call out rebar by number. Number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The number is the number of eights in the diameter. Okay, That's what the number is on rebar. So a number six rebar is six eighths of an inch diameter. So that's three quarter inch. Okay. Rebar is a real mild steel. It's it's uh, very low carbon content. It's quite ductile. Actually, I was behind a rebar truck driving in today, and uh, that steel was just bouncing as they were driving down the road. It's really you know it, it, it's not real rigid. It, it's quite flexible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's three quarter inch. So that's eight times what? Pi times three eighths of an inch squared. That'd be the radius, okay? So that's the diameter. So the radius is three eighths, which, if I remember right, is 0.375 inches. So why don't we get that decimal just so we've got good notes for later, okay? And you square that, and that gets you the area. Okay. And that's 3.53 square inches. 
So that's the area of the steel. And then, of course, the area of the concrete is pi r squared minus the area of the steel. And you can get that figured out. And that's going to be quite a bit higher, which is the norm. I mean, concrete is a cheaper material than steel. So that's 448 point, uh, it's not quite working out the way that I expected. Four, oh, yeah, sure thing. Okay, so 448.86. There we go. All right. So those are the two areas. So you're going to take, divide the uh, area. Of, so what I'm doing there, I'm taking that total circular area and then subtracting out the area of the steel. That's how I'm coming up with the area of the concrete. So that's 448.86 inches squared. And then you divide that by the modulus for concrete, which is 1,200 pounds per inch squared. Okay, And then what you're going to do is equate that to what's happening with the steel. Okay, You're going to take the load of the steel times the length of the steel, divided by the area of the steel, and divided by E for the steel. And that allows you to relate the two loads together because you know that they deform together. As that pier gets shorter, the concrete is shorter, as is the steel is shorter too, right? So you can work through that. And what you can get is you can get to two conclusions. You know, it just depends on how you solve it. I want to get this set up for a nice substitution so I can work through this. And then I can get an expression for the load in the steel when I do it. So the load in the steel is 0 0.1268 times the load in the concrete. And then the load in the concrete then is 7.883 times the load in the steel. Okay. Either way, okay, those are just inverses of each other. So now you've got a substitution. So you've got uh, two equations and two unknowns now, okay? So here's one equation, call that equation two. And there's equation one, okay? So you got two of them. You can combine them and you can come up with what the loads are, okay? So that's just going a step beyond statics. You can generate one more equation by using strengths and looking at the delta relationships. So what you would do here would be to solve equation one and equation two simultaneously. Let's say for an engineer, solving the equations simultaneously is probably easier than spelling simultaneously. But, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll call that good, simultaneously. Uh -huh. um, okay, and then what you're going to get are these loads. And the load in the steel is uh, 10,127 pounds. And the load in the concrete then is 79,873. Right now, from there, you can check a few things. You can find the stress in the steel, which is just P over A. And you can find the stress in the concrete, again, P over A. And you can check those. You always want to check and make sure you're not stressing something too much. And I don't think we have any trouble with this thing. So it's 2866 pounds per square inch for the steel. I think quite a bit less for the concrete, 178. And so they're both well within the tolerances for those materials. And then you can find delta is PL over AE. And if I have just an extra minute, I like to uh, run it for both sides. I mean, I know they're equal, but if I run it independently for both sides and get the same answer both times, that's a good check on everything I've done. Okay. So what I just found there, the main thing that I solved for with my equations is I found the load in the steel and the load in the concrete. Once I've got that, I can find the stress 
and I can also find the deltas. I know the deltas should equal each other, so. So that's a good thing when I check both of them and they come out to be equal. Questions on that one? How about this one? Are there questions on the last one that's due, 162? This one's kind of, it, it uses the same principles as the previous one. It just gets more complicated. Got a little bit more going on with uh, some of the some of the relationships here. Um, okay. so this is going to be one of those uh, PL over AE things. Probably want to get the areas of those bars. Okay. Now on this one, um, kind of what the deal is on this is you can't um, your your uh, statics gets a little trickier on this, okay? So what you want to do is you want to relate BE to CF, okay? That's your goal here. That's what we want to do. So we need equations that are going to do that. Now, if sum of FX is zero is not going to get us anything, okay? Um, sum of Fy equals zero would get us BE and CF, but the problem is if we go sum of Fy equals zero, we're also going to pick up RA, okay? And, and so we're going to pick up that unknown if we do that. They're actually RAY, I guess I should say. So my free body diagram would be something like that. Now, the one equation that will actually relate BE and CF together is a sum of moments about A and set that equal to zero. Okay. That, that's the equation that I would use that will really relate those things together. So I would have, um, and I use P instead of F. They're just letters that don't matter. So I'll turn those into P's, okay? Okay, so what I would do then, if I sum moments about A, is I would have minus PBE times 24 inches. That's a clockwise moment there. Actually, that's counterclockwise, so I better make that plus. There we go. And then I'm going to have another term there for uh, PCF. And I'm going to have minus the 15,000 pounds times its moment arm from A. 24 and 16 get me 40. 20 more get me 60. So there you go. So there's a way that you can set up a relationship and figure out a little bit what's happening here with, uh, with the relationship between PBE and PCF. Okay. So what I'm going to end up with there is 90,000. And that's going to equal 24 PBE plus 40 PBF. Okay. So that's the relationship that I can use to equate these things together. What I ended up doing with that is I ended up solving for PBE. And that got me a nice little substitution that I could set up. So 37,500 minus 1.667 
times PCF. Hmm. Wait, what do I got going? Because you got ninety thousand Oh, right. That should have been CF. Thank you. Got a typo right here. Okay. All right, so there's that's my first equation, and this comes from statics. So that's equation number one. Right, now the next thing to do is to lose the strengths because I got um, one equation with two unknowns. If I use some of Fy for a second equation, it's not going to help me because I'm going to get an, I'm going to be able to get a second equation, but I'm also going to have a second unknown Ray in the equation. So that's not going to help. Okay. All right, now the next thing I want to do here is get a strengths of equation, uh, sorry, strengths of materials equation here that I can relate with this. And what I would look at here is what's happening with that big bar, ABC. You're given that it's quite strong and it's not going to, uh, to deform or anything, okay? ABCD is a rigid beam. It'll rotate about A because there's a pin joint there, but it's not going to bend. It's going to keep in a straight line. So what we're going to get there is a little section of an arc, kind of like that, okay? Now, if that's small enough, and it will be small, you can approximate an arc with a right triangle if you want to start looking at deformations. And I've seen this analogy used a few times in a few different disciplines, so it's a good one to remember. If you've got a small angle on an arc, you can approximate that with, with a right triangle. It works pretty well. And keep in mind that when we do work in engineering, we approximate everything. I mean, we don't, you know, we have all these nice equations and things, but they're not perfect. There's none of this stuff we use is perfect. Okay, that's why we use safety factors. Okay. We'll let the mathematicians and to some degree the scientists get it perfect. We, we build stuff and we want it to stand up. So, you know, we, we do these types of things all the time, some more obvious than others. Okay. All right, so what I have there is a triangle. And see, I can relate delta B to delta C now by using similar triangles. Okay, so I can say that delta B is to this distance, which I think is 16 inches. And then I can equate that to delta C. Okay, and you can figure out what to put down there. Nothing too much on that. All right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah, thank you. I've got a bus there. All right, now if I want to, so what I have then is A to B. Um, so, so now I have a, a, a way of relating the deltas together. It's not like the previous problem. They're not equal, but still I can relate them together. So what I can say here is delta equals PL over AE. I know that. What I can say is PBE, which is what I want to find, times its length, which is 18 inches, over its area, which is uh, 8 inches squared. divided by its modulus, which is uh, 6 times 10 to the 6. Okay. I can equate that then to uh, PCF times its length divided by its area divided by its modulus. Now I've got to add something to those equations though because they're not equal. All right. But what is equal is if I put in the denominator 24 and whatever that number is, then there, then I can equate them, okay? Because that's the relationship, okay? So on the, the concrete pier, I just said they were equal. Here they're not, but all the same, I can get a relationship between them. So that's fine, okay? So we all right with that? Mm -hmm. 
So the, the, the idea on this stuff is you do all the statics you can that, that will help you. In this case, it's just a moment about A. In this case, it was just sum of F, uh, Fy is zero. That was about it. And then you use the strength materials. And to do that, you have to relate the delta of one material to the delta of the other. Here they were equal. Here they are based on similar triangles. There's a ratio between them. Okay. Now, when you work through that, what you'll get to, if you know, you could do it different ways, of course. What I got to when I worked through it was I ended up on um, PBE. There's 0 0.5556 times PCF. That's what I ended up with. And I should make that a P, not an F. And then I know I have an expression here for PBE that I can substitute in. What I've got from up above here is at 37.5 minus 1.667. So that's 37.50, is it? 500. And let's see, now I'm screwing up here. Aren't I? Yeah, I'm sorry, let me get that fixed. Okay, what I know is that PBE is 37.500 minus um, 1.667 times PCF. So what that means is 37,500 minus 1.667 times PCF is 0 0.5556 times PCF. Okay? So I can go ahead and solve that and I can figure out what PCF is. And that comes out to be... 16,873. Okay. And then PBE will be 0 0.5556 times that. So PBE is going to be 9372. Good with that. So once you have those loads, you can figure out really whatever it is you need to find out. Um, you can find, so you got the two forces. Now the last thing I ask you is how far down will point D move? And there's another one of those D words, deflection. That means deformation, it means displacement. They all begin with the letter D. And you know, English is like has lots of vocabulary in it, lots of different words, and I, I kind of pick the word that seems to fit the sentence, right? So, but they all begin with the letter D, okay? That's the thing to remember. All right, so the last little bit here is to go back to those similar triangles. Um, what you're going to want to do is find delta, um, well, let's say delta B, because you know that delta is PL over AE. So delta B then is the load. 9372 pounds times the length, 18 inches, divided by the area, which is 8 inches squared, divided by the modulus, which is 6 times 10 to the 6 pounds per inch squared. Work that all out, and you get 0.00. .00 Okay, and then you can do the same sort of thing. You can find delta C, and of course that's going to come out to be a little bit bigger, and that's 0 0.005, uh, whatever the heck, 5859. Okay, I'm good with that. And that's just plugging it in. And then what you can do is back up here, and now you know what those numbers are here, okay? So you know this one, and the first one is 0 0.003514. And you can find the second one, 0 0.005859. So 
So you can find delta D over here. It's all just one similar triangle. So you can use similar triangles to figure out how far down D will move because you know A, B, C, D is in a straight line. So what you can do is use similar triangles. to find uh, delta D, because you know those other two deltas now. It's all proportional. You got any questions on that? Those are the three that are due tomorrow. Is that, we good? Yeah. Got a couple minutes here, yeah. But, okay. All right, so uh, whenever I get that key lined out, we'll get into Form 115. When that time comes, I'll, I'll put out a Moodle message. I'll put a note up on the door and all that, so you know, we'll, we'll get that worked out. We'll get away from this noise, okay? Good enough? All right, I'll see you.